morning to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. September has been a funny month, August and September, with different distractions from what we had diverted to. And I'm going to do my best to finish today on this subject of unity. Ephesians chapter number 4. It always amazes me how timely the messages of God come. And, um, you know, having been questioned many times about things in, in the years, uh, it's always, again, it's always remarkable to me that uh, folks miss just how timely the messages of God can be. And, um, you know, I suppose if, if you're only focused on your own self and things, that that's probably the way it goes. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not a rebuke. I'm just making an observation. Um, so it just, uh, I guess it just uh, amazes me uh, how some folks can, can miss that. But uh, I appreciate the timing of God. Not only the messages of God, but the timing of God. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Brother Gonderman said something when he was here some time back. He said, you know, you think that your pastor's preaching about you, and he is. He just doesn't know it. <laughs> and uh, that was... That, that was uh, I was reminded of that truth this past week. All right, Ephesians chapter number four. We've been looking at the subject of unity. I didn't intend, as usual, I don't intend for things to go so in depth and for so long. And again, as usual, the more I think and more I study, the more things begin to develop. And uh, we looked back there at Psalm chapter number 133 about, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We looked at the oil that was poured upon the head of Aaron and uh, drip down to the skirts of his garments, and we looked at the dew that drops on the Mount Hermon, and we looked at the dew that's on the mountains of Zion, and how that distills down and, and refreshes. And, and uh, so that really was, uh, that was the springboard for us to understand what unity is like, and what it should look like, and how pleasant that is to God, and how beautiful it is. And then I spent uh, one week dealing with the negative aspect of things, uh, you know, what causes disunity, and uh, we just pointed out about f five categories, I think, of things that cause disunity. This week I want to hopefully finish on achieving biblical unity. How do we achieve biblical unity? Uh, many times, many times as I'm studying, God points out something new to me. Uh, it's maybe an older truth, but it's a new truth in, in light of current events or current happenings. And I hope that you'll find this to be fresh for you as well and not simply just glaze over it because it's probably something that someone along the line in your life has preached to you. Um, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number four, and uh, I don't really know the best way to go about this. I want to just go ahead and read the, uh, the first three verses and then I'll make a few more comments. We'll pray and we'll go on. Ephesians chapter number four and verse number one. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Heavenly Father, help me, please, that I can make this truth, these truths today, clear and helpful to your people. And I pray, God, that you'll help to guard our minds against those things uh, that uh, perhaps. Uh, could be taken out of context, but uh, just help us not to do that, to just take it, God, as you teach it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What brings unity? I, I can't help but say this again, that there's no way for us as a church. And this is how I'm trying to contextualize the messages, okay? As a church, there's no way for us to be in unity until everyone knows Jesus Christ as Savior. We, we, we really do have to grasp that and understand that. And if, if and in, in, in almost every church I've ever been in, there's been those that you wonder. I, I am not the one who determines whether someone's saved or not. I'm not saying that. But there's always been someone along the line that you just said, boy, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if they're saved. And so I, I don't believe that we're immune to that. You know, sometimes you just wonder. And again, please don't say, well, he's picking on me. Look, sometimes we just wonder. And I don't know how else to put that. It's not because we're mean, it's because we care. <laughs> it's because we care. And sometimes the caring of people is misunderstood too. You need to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You'll never be able to be in unity with those who are saved if you don't know Him. 
it's impossible for you to unify with something that you are completely out of, you're just outside of the context. It's try, you know, the old trying to put a, a round peg in a square hole, right? Amen. And that's just, that's not how that works. And God tells us that we cannot be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We often talk about that in the, in the marriage, right? For marriage, you can't be unequally yoked. We talk that in the, uh, the sense of business. We often say in, in business, when people ever ask me about that, I say I would never go into a partnership with someone where there's an equal footing where one's lost. I wouldn't just go into partnership myself with someone who is lost because you're not, you don't think the same. You're not approaching business the same. We hope. Right? If we're going to obey the Bible, there's going to be differences. And so there's, the, the, the application of that is absolutely universal. But the context of it is the church. The context is the church. We're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? We don't ever want to push someone who's unsaved out of our church. That's never our intention. We want them to be here and to get saved and to come along and grow with us. But do you understand how that immediately presents the issue of you, you're, you're, not, you're not trying to put two things together that are alike but aren't alike. You're trying to put something together that just doesn't fit. They're completely different. And so the church, the local church, was intended to be for believers. It's not meant to be an evangelistic platform even though sometimes we do that, it's meant to be for believers. Amen. So as a church, if we're going to be in unity, then you've got to be saved. And then not only saved, but we've got to agree that we want to walk with God together. Amen. And those were the things that we dealt with last time. If we're not walking with God together, then the disunity comes. But here in Ephesians chapter number 4, there are... There are two things that are mentioned, and I'm going to say two, but divided into three parts. These things are mentioned that the word unity is actually spoken, and it's one of three times in the scriptures that the word unity is used. Psalm 133 was unity twice here in Ephesians 4. Now that immediately should tell us that unity in the local church is, is one of God's top priorities, right? Two times the word used, he's using it in the context of a local church. So we need to understand that. We've got we to gotta bring our mind to that straight away. I'm not ruling out that it also refers to the greater body of Christ as well. But what I'm saying is that the, the primary application is going to be to a local assembly of people. Now, I've been looking at these verses for well over a month. And I've tried several different ways to attack it. And the best way I think to attack it, maybe that's not the right word to use, but that's what we're going to say today is to go ahead and just give you a commentary on the verses so we understand them together. And so I want you to come back to Ephesians 4 with me. And before we start working through these verses, remember that back in chapter number 3 of, of Ephesians, in fact, let me say this. The Ephesians church had some Jews in it, but was primarily Gentile. And he deals with that in chapter 1, talking about their salvation and and then in chapter 2, talking again about their salvation, how the middle wall of partition has been broken down between us. In chapter 3, he's, he gives to us then the, the mystery of the body, that Jew and Gentile come together in one body. Okay? And that's found in chapter number 3. That's the mystery of the body of Christ, the church. Jews and Gentiles coming together. Now, if you think of that, you're going to see straight away that there's going to be conflict. Just like there is with us. We're, we're looking at several different cultures in our church. I'm looking at different cultures that I sit here right now, a number of different cultures. And then even if we just if we said, let's take all of the foreign cultures out and, and just to those who are natural-born Australians, then you'd have different cultures, subcultures within the culture. I mean, you got Queenslanders. Amen. Okay, I gave you a chance. We got... Tasmanians. Hey Amen. We got a Tassie. We got one Tasmanian. And a Kiwi. Okay, you don't count. Uh, we got some Victorians, if I remember right. We've got some New South Walens. I don't know how else to say it. Welsh, New South Welshmen. And they're all different. 
if, if you've never been out of your own state and traveled around Australia, you're missing something. Because Australia is diverse amongst Australians. Okay? And what it does is it brings conflict with it. And God deals with that in these verses. So you can understand that there would be serious differences in the believers, not only cultural here, but uh, their religious background is different. And whether we like it or not, even if we, if we get saved, when we come together from different religious backgrounds, we view things differently. Our personalities are different. Our opinions are different. Our practices are different. It has a potential to be a tinderbox of contention if we're not careful. Now there's, as I said, I'm going to name three things, but I, I believe the second two are united together, okay? So I want you to notice that this first time that the unity is, re, is referred to in this chapter, it's something we already have, but we're told to keep. The second set are those things that we're to grow into. We don't have them, but we're to grow into them. And all of them bring unity. So we come back here. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 1. I therefore, this is in a reference now to the revealing of the mystery of the body. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. He's, he's begging that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. So each one of us has a call that, uh, there's a call for us to walk worthy. And that word worthy means suitably. A worthy walk according to the vocation. Now, please don't let me bore you with definitions. I think it's important because we need to understand that we're talking the same lingo here. Amen. God calls us according to a vocation. That is a, a calling in life. That's a designation. Now, if we were to do a, a broad study on this, we'd go over to Romans 12 or we'd go over to 1 Corinthians 12 and we'd talk about the different body parts as God puts them together. And that's what this reference is to. And so we have a designation in the church and so we're called to walk this walk in a suitable way, this vocation that God's called each one of us to. And we're, we're to do that. Then we look at verse number two. He says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. So our worthy walk, our suitable walk, is to be done with, and, and I like that word all, all. That, that means that we've got to make every effort to make this happen, okay? There's responsibility that lies with every one of us. Now, I, I may get ahead of myself a bit, but it's, it's suitable here to say it. If we're to have unity, there's this personal responsibility to it. And we can't just expect that because we've got the indwelling Holy Spirit that everything's going to be sweet. We don't have to make an effort. If we don't make an effort, whether it's in the church or the home, whatever, it, it's not going to happen. There's too much of our old carnality in us. Amen. There's too much of it there. I wish it was gone. I wish it was eradicated the moment we got saved, but it's not. And so Galatians 5 tells us that the flesh is lusting against the spirit, and the spirit is lusting against the flesh. And so we're to walk, he says, with all lowliness. That has to do with our humility. Now, can I say that in a, in a church, I'll do my best to keep this in the setting of a church. In a local church, there is absolutely no room for somebody that's just over, overflowing with pride. And I've seen it so many times. As soon as somebody gets puffed up with pride, there's straightaway division. Might be a division between themselves and someone else in the church uh, as just a member or someone in leadership. But it, without fail, as soon as pride raises up, contention comes with it. Amen. And that's what Proverbs said. Only by pride cometh contention. So we're to do it with humility and with meekness. And meekness means that you can put up with some injury that people do things in the church that bother you or hurt you along the way, and you're not going to, can I just speak plainly today? You're not going to spit the dummy and pack your bags just simply because somebody did something that hurt you or hurt your feelings along the way. We all get hurt. Amen. That's, just the, that's part of life. There is no part of our lives that we can't go through without being hurt. That's true in the secular world. What's amazing to me is how many people bail out on God saying it's the church's fault because they got hurt along the way. You don't bail out on your job because you got hurt along the way. What makes the difference? A paycheck. That's what makes the difference. We're so devoted to the paycheck, we'll put up with it. 
Now, sometimes we'll bail out, but by and large, people will stick, they'll stick with, they'll put up with it for a long time, but not in a church. God said you're going to have to have all lowliness and meekness. And then he says you've got to have to do it with long suffering. That means, again, putting up with things for a long period of time, and you're going to have to forbear. You're going to have to pause. You're going to have to hold yourself back in love. That's verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. So you know what we do? We get hurt. Someone says something. Someone does something. It may rub us the wrong way. It might actually cut us to the quick. But God tells us, I want you to keep walking in the context of your local church. And I want you to keep moving forward. And the reason I want you to have your humility, your lowliness and your meekness, and your forbearance is because what is a greater aspect to us is our love for one another. The Bible tells us that love covereth all things. It says the same about charity. If love is going to cover all things, then that means that if you injure me, even if it's intentionally, I'm going to go ahead and take it, and I'm going to go on in my vocation and I'm going to walk in my vocation, calling of God, in a suitable manner. Do you see? Now he goes on and he says in verse number 3, endeavoring, endeavoring. You need to make every effort, every effort. Striving, the word endeavor means to strive. Make every attempt. He says endeavoring to keep, and then here's our first juice in this chapter, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so the first thing that I want you to write down if you're taking notes or at least just write it down in your heart is that what, how do we achieve unity is by having the unity of the spirit. And I'm going to just really simplify it down to this. What brings unity in the church? The spirit of God. The spirit of God brings unity in the church. We're to endeavor to keep it. That is to maintain it, to guard it. We're going to guard it. We're going to Make sure that nothing is able to interfere. We're not going to let circumstances and we're not going to allow words or choices or decisions of others to interrupt the unity that is the Spirit of God. And he says there at the end of that verse, endeavoring to keep this unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, by the cement work of peace, the binding agent of peace. Now, you have an error in this sense. In some senses, people, will, they'll, they'll err to have peace with everyone at the cost of doctrine. That's not what he's referring to here. Amen. Or peace with everyone at the cost of honoring Jesus Christ. Again, that's not at all what this is about. This is about the things that have injured me, the things that have cut across my path or that I've done to hurt you in the process those aren't going to divert the rest of everyone around me from walking the path that God's chosen for them in that church because they love one another and they recognize that it is not of God for there to be division, not over those matters. Does that make sense? He says, I want peace to bind you together and that unity is going to be a product of the Holy Spirit of God. So each one of us needs to walk worthy of the call that God has given to us to carry out as individuals inside of our church. There is no one saved and placed in the body to sit. That that, that was never, ever on the radar of Almighty God. Every person is to have an active part. That's your vocation. Um, We need to be seeking God in that matter. What God, what am I here for? What What am I supposed to be achieving? It's my purpose. We to do that with humility and forbearance and knowing that we will need to cease from responding to the injuries that come to us from other brethren. And they're going to show us the same courtesy. We're doing it out of love for one another. As we each carry out our calling of God, we'll need to make every effort, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit with the binding agent of peace. 
So let's try to understand then what is this unity of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is diverse. God said that there are diversities of gifts, but one Lord. The administrations are different. How people administrate things are different. There's just one God. So he refers to these things. The Spirit of God is diverse. And and let me say this here. This passage isn't teaching doctrinally on any matter. It's teaching apart from unity. I want to say it that way. This passage is not teaching on a doctrinal matter apart from unity. It's not establishing truth separate from the other passages in the Bible. It is clear that this passage is intended to to bring about unity. It's mentioned twice. When when you have two mentions of a word in a single passage, that becomes the theme of the passage. Okay? Especially in light of the rest of the context of the chapters and the whole book. So it's important to bear that in mind too as we go through this. So the Spirit of God then, being diverse is not divided. There's a big difference. The Spirit of God does not cause strife and contention. He's diverse. There's differences about Him and how He operates. But He's not divisive. Do you understand? So you say, well, how do you know that? The following verses. We can't separate these following verses from the context. This is what I mean about the the context itself is teaching doctrine on unity. It's not teaching an outside subject to this. Believe me, I I ended up spending oodles and oodles of time looking up words and studying and cross-referencing. In the end, I went, no, that's not what we're here for, okay? That's not the study at hand. So we look at the following verses and we have to understand something that division in the context of our church or a church, I should say, comes from man not living under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. If there's division in the church, it's because of man. It's not God. God didn't do that. People all the time say, well, God told me to do this. And it's like this with maybe the leadership or the bulk of the church. And and they're walking with God and they claim to be walking with God. And you say, well, something's wrong. You know, sometimes people say, well, God told me or God led me and God wasn't in the equation when you made that decision. Now, that can be true on either side. Either side. Sometimes the leadership is wrong and someone has to take a stand about something. Okay, do you understand where we're coming from here? So the division comes from man. It's not... Uh, it, it's not God. We've got to live under the control of the Spirit of God. And as such, we must be mindful that as we carry out the calling of God in our lives along with other believers, we let the Spirit of God have full control of all of us, keeping us in the state of one, unity, being unified, as He carries out His desired work through us. And so we look, and that really is verses 2 and 3. So the difficulty here is found in this. And I am going to come to verses 4 and following. Don't don't worry. I'm just, I I keep pointing that out for a reason. What is the difficulty in keeping the unity of the Spirit come in? Well, firstly, it's the fact that none of us remains under the control of the Holy Spirit all the time. We wish we would, and many, I think, strive to that, but none of us stays under the power of God's Spirit at all points in time. So that's a difficulty. That's a problem. Hence, he says, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You're going to have to work at it. You have it because if you're saved, you have the Spirit of God living in you and He's not divided. Do you see? So if there's division, it was me and I'm not endeavoring enough to keep that unity. I I, I need to examine my own heart. It may not be me. It may be the other bloke. But I at least have to be honest enough to check myself. So there's the problem of not being under the power of the Spirit of God all the time. The second problem that I see in keeping the unity of the Spirit is just this possession of our old sinful nature still. (laughs) Just a stubborn, self-willed nature. And we like to have it our way. We like things to be our way. We have our own view. We have our own backgrounds, opinions, all those things we talked about. The third thing is 
that some simply just don't take the time or care enough to obey verses 1 through 3 to really uh, to, to bring about the unity. They just don't care. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven, and that's all that's required of me, and the rest of you can work around me, and I'm just going to be me. <laughs> that always grates me the wrong way when people say, well, this is just me. You're just going to have to live with it. And I always say, well, what, what is God making you, though? What does God want you to be? Because if you're just you as you were before you were saved, well, what good is salvation? Amen. And then it just causes strife and contention and division in a church. It's craziness. Amen. I don't want to be what I am. I want to be what God's making me. Amen. And that's what we're to be striving for. So it, it causes conflict when people just won't obey those verses. Now, here's a blessing. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. But look what God said to us in verse number 7. Because someone may say, well, I just can't do that. Really? Verse number 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Well, you most certainly do have what, what it takes to obey these verses because Jesus Christ gave you grace. He measured it out to you so you could do it. And I could do it. All right, now again, that's what we have and we must strive or endeavor to keep it. Now I want to move into the next two points. It's a single point, but it's two. All right, I don't know how, you'll see when we get there what I mean. But the next two points that we're going to have are this. We don't have it, but let's go get it. We don't have it yet, but let's go get it. And so he says here in verse 4, remember now, let's tie us all together. He's speaking of unity, talks about the unity of the Spirit. Now he's going to illustrate that, beginning in verse number 4. And he says, there is one body. Why? Well, because, because there's one. Because there's just one body. There's not many, many bodies. Oh, but there are many bodies, Pastor. Yeah, but there's one. There's just one. And then he says, and one Spirit. Well, I thought Revelation said there's seven spirits. Indeed, but there's one spirit. It's unified. They're not at odds with each other. The seven spirits of God are not at odds with each other. Doesn't that even sound funny? When I say it, I think, oh, I hope I'm not drifting off into some strange doctrine. And I'm not. But to say it that way sounds funny because he's the spirit of God. But what about these seven spirits of God? Well, they're not at odds with each other. They just, they work together. It's seven aspects of the spirit of God. Amazing. You say, I don't understand that. Well, join the club. All right. He says, then he, uh, he goes on. I can't linger too long. There's one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. So there's one hope and one calling there, right? Verse 5, there's one Lord. Yeah, but God the Father and the Son are both called Lord. How can there be one? Because they're not divided. Amen. There's one faith. There's one baptism. Wait a minute. I can, I can show you seven baptisms in the Bible, and they're not all water baptism. Amen. Well, how about that? How can you say there's one? Because there's one. They're not in conflict with each other. Verse number six, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Oh, so he's in all of us, but he's not divided. Amen. He's one. Now we come to verse seven again, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now watch this. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far above, up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Now here's what I'm saying. It's two, but it's one, because these are unified, but he... he the way he phrases it, it's like two points. Watch, verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and, if you will, the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. No, I'm not adding to the Bible. I'm giving you the sense of it there. Verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up 
into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That, I mean, that's a mouthful of verses in one sentence. That, every time I read that, I laugh. So let's break it down a little bit here. Verses 4 through 6 show us the Holy Spirit describing unity. One body. One body. And, and please don't make that a, a passage that you base your doctrine on. Please don't do that. Believe me, I spent a lot of time. I got all the verses written down right here that we could go through, and I'm not going to. But I'm telling you this. There is one body. He says there's one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. God has given us that grace in verse 7 to walk according to the vocation God has given each of us while maintaining yet unity. And brethren, we need grace to do it. Because... <laughs> I'm not easy to get along with, and neither are you. <laughs> so we need grace. Amen. And then verses 8 to 10, he, he, not only then, and, and now here's the crux of the matter. So with the Spirit of God, you're saved, you have Him, and He says, keep that unity. With the next two that we found in verse 13, these are things you're trying to get to. You don't have them, but let's strive to obtain them. How does God help us to obtain it? Don't miss this. Because He not only gave us grace... But he gave us gifts. Amen. The grace we've spoken about already. But when he says in verse 18, wherefore, that's the same as saying for this reason. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he ascended up into heaven, gave men gifts. I'm just I'm skip, I'm I'm reading through my notes because I, I want to get this right. So you're gonna have to bear with me today. I want to make sure I have it right. Look at verse eight again. Wherefore, for this reason, he saith he quotes the psalm, but he he brings that psalm sixty eight. He brings it into uh, the New Testament. He says, when he Christ ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Those were the people who have already gone. They were the Old Testament believers, if you like. And he led them captive, taking them up to heaven with him because now the sacrifice has been made and they can go with him. And as he leaves, he says, now I'm going to give you that I leave behind gifts and gave gifts unto men. Now, it's not that verse 9 and 10 are unimportant, but it's a parenthesis here and we don't need to bog down in it. He just simply talks about ascending and descending. Okay, now we can do that some other time, but let's go straight to verse number 11. Because now he talks about these gifts. And what are these gifts for? To help us attain, to help us obtain the unity that we're striving for in verse 13. And so he says in verse number 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. What were the gifts? People. They were people. Again, this week I was reminded by just circumstances, different people. Uh, I, don't, I don't need a pastor. I'll become my own. Okay. Go ahead. I'm your pastor, not your master. When you leave this room, I don't have control over your private life. You do whatever you want. In fact, let me set the record straight on something that has been said again through this course of this week that's been severely misunderstood and misinterpreted about me. I've mentioned many times, you know, that it irritates me about the whole YouTube and Internet preaching stuff. And it does. It irritates me. And I haven't changed my opinion on it at all. You watch whatever you want to watch. You go home and you can watch it till the cows come home. I'm not going to come check it out. However, when we're here and it matters to me, I'm going to say something about it. Amen. And when I'm being held accountable for what other preachers are saying, you can bet I'm going to flare up. Amen. Amen. All right. So now for those that were so angry at me for saying, you know, you need to shut off the YouTube because there's so much garbage out there. Watch whatever you want. I'm not checking up on you. Okay. 
Now we're clear. Um, you say, why are you saying that? God's plan and design was for people to come together in a local church. Amen. And he gave gifts. And, and again, you take this out of context. Mm. He gave gifts unto men. He gives pastors and teachers who then devote their life to studying the word of God and loving and praying for that local church and teaching them and to invest himself in his Bible so that he can invest himself in those people. And is he always right? No, because he's just as human as the next person. But I'm telling you this and there's no way around it. Whether you're talking about the pastor you have standing in front of you now or whether it's someone else, they are a gift from God. They are a gift from God. And what are they there for? To help you to achieve unity. Because we're not unified by nature. By nature, I want it my way. And by nature, you want it your way. Amen. And some of us are a little bit more pig-headed than the others about it. Some are, you know, a little bit more happy to just let things be as they are and go their own way. You know, so, and I envy people like that. Some of us are a little bit more stubborn than that. And man, we want to have it our way. <laughs> and we'll fight over it. And God said, I don't want you fighting over it. Amen. I've given you someone who is going to take the word of God and they're going to instruct you and help you and lead you and teach you and pray for you and care for you, a pastor and a teacher so that you can be unified and put aside all of that childish nonsense. Amen. Now, I know who I'm speaking to today and I, I know that some of what I'm saying could be taken to say, oh, wait a minute, is that directed at me? Guys, I'm telling you, this is what the Bible says. It's directed at you because the Bible says it. It's not someone singling another person out. It's not. Now, here we go. Verse 11, he gives these people gifts. Not every people gift or person gift, if you like, was given to every person, every group. Because he said in verse 8, he gave gifts unto men. We understand that to be the church. Verse number 11, he gave some of those men. Men used in a generic sense. It's the church. He gave some apostles. Well, he didn't give you an apostle. <laughs> All right, and he gave some men or church prophets. He didn't give you a prophet either. Now, yes, my spiritual gift is that of prophecy, but not one of telling the future, but rather one of just declaring what God said. Amen. All right, that's it's my spiritual gift, and it's what gets me in my most trouble if it's not under the power of the Spirit of God. Sometimes, even under the power of the Spirit of God, it seems to cause me issues. And he also gave some evangelists. Now, I know there's a lot of argument about what the evangelists are. God, I'm, I'm just telling you this is my opinion. You can take it or leave it if you like, but an evangelist is one who declares the gospel. They are evangels. They tell of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I believe with all my heart that that's the missionaries, that we call them missionaries today. They are ones who go out, and they are pioneers, and they preach the gospel, and they see people saved, and that's just how when they're under the power of God's Spirit, that's what they do best. And he gave some pastors and teachers. There's no comma between pastors and teachers because it's a united uh, gift. Amen. Paul told Timothy he better be apt to teach. A pastor who can't teach, who simply wants to preach, has missed his calling. Amen. We have to be able to teach. That's what God gave you. Verse number 12. Now, that, and notice something, by the way. Uh, this is a consistent thought through this whole thing of, of, of grace given by measure, of the gifts given by measure to God, right? Or from God, I need to say. Not everybody has the same measure of grace. Not everyone has the same people gift. It's consistent in God's teaching. Verse 12. Here we find a threefold purpose, a threefold purpose of these people gifts given by Jesus Christ, which then help believers walk worthy of the vocation wherewith they are called. And the first one is, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. This is an active and a progressive work. This is something that, 
the pastor teacher should constantly be striving for, helping people to become perfected. Are they going to become sinlessly perfect? <laughs> no. No, but we're striving for it. Amen. And we're striving for a spiritual maturity amongst ourselves. Amen. And how's that being achieved? Through the gift that Jesus Christ gave so that we could be unified. The second purpose and the threefold purpose is the work of the ministry. He says in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. This shows that every saved person has a job to do in and through their church in which God's placed them. Every one of us has a job. What is it? The third purpose is found again at the end of verse number 12 for the edifying of the body of Christ. This idea of edifying is the building up of believers collectively. And it refers specifically to building up of strength and knowledge in holy matters. Oh, there's so many things that I want to say. Lots of thoughts that flowed to leading up to today. But I'm just going to leave it at that. So what is my job? To help perfect you. To teach you the work of the ministry. And to edify the body of Christ. To build you up. I'm going to build you up by teaching you what does God say about living a godly life. Amen. I'm going to be building you up by telling you this is wrong. Whatever, the, whatever you fill in the gap with, if, if it's from the Word of God and it said, this is wrong, it doesn't please God, you say, no, I don't want to be hear the negative. God says, you're missing it. That's building you up because you're being told what you're doing isn't pleasing to God. Edifying isn't simply about appeasing people. It's not about making people feel happy and clappy all the time. It's about stripping away the things that keep us from loving God and serving God and knowing God the way He wants us to know Him. It's what keeps us from being holy that He wants stripped away from us. And He declares to us in Peter, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And everyone, not everyone, I'm sorry, so many say, Well, I don't need someone to tell me that. God says we do. Amen. God says we do need that. Now, there's a lot of issues that come into this, right? The, uh, a pastor with the right spirit, a right attitude, and, and, and conducting himself the way he ought to. And, and I know all that. It needs to be said. It's just not for today. But it, I, I understand. I understand. But God's purpose was that these are the three things that would happen. Now, Verse 13, till, till. This word till, many times we use it in the sense of there's a conclusion. In this, in this sense, there's, it's, it's like a conclusion, but it's an ongoing conclusion. Amen. Because we're never going to reach perfection until we get to heaven. But we can reach maturity. And yet, even the most mature believer would say, I still got a long way to go. Some of the godliest people I knew that I thought, man, you know, just to be able to, to have the relationship with God that they have, if you ask them, they would say, there's so much about me that still needs to change because I'm not yet like Christ. Amen. So when we read in verse 13, till, don't think of that, that, oh, okay, ding, 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 ring the bell, I've reached that point and I'm out the door now, I don't need this any longer. That's not at all what God had in mind. It's an ongoing conclusion. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. So as the pastor or those people gifts, let me say it that way, as those people gifts are carrying out their threefold purpose, there are two things that will come to pass. We will come to the unity of the faith and we will come to the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. It's right there in verse 13. This is what I mean. I've studied and studied and studied this passage so many different times. And for me, it was like a fresh light coming on it and saying, wait, that's how we achieve unity. We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit we already have, but we are striving to achieve that unity that God set before us, and we do that through the people gifts that God's given us. 
Verse 13, till we come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, if you read through the rest, and we did, but if you read through and really pick it apart, the end of verse 13 through verse 16, all of those verses point in one direction, and it's this. Grow up, become mature. Grow up and become mature in your faith. Okay? He mentions there in verse 13 that we're to come unto the perfect man. He says in verse number 14, we're to be no more children. In verse 15, he says, grow up. And then verse 16, he talks about the body that is working in such a way that it's now building itself up in love. So what is the faith that unifies? Or more importantly, what is the faith? Most fundamentally, it's a reference to salvation through Jesus Christ. It's the gospel. That's the most fundamental understanding of the phrase, the faith. In Acts 6, verse 7, the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith, the gospel message of Christ. But more broadly, as we look in the word of God, it also includes the body of truth which surrounds faith in Christ. As we've already said, getting saved, that's just the beginning. That's not the end. That's not the conclusion. When I get saved, my next purpose is now to become more like Jesus Christ. And with that, there's a lot of truth surrounding the gospel message. Right? Amen. A lot of truth. And so we look at... Uh, for instance, Romans chapter 14, verse 1 says this, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. So there will be some that uh, they may be saved a short time or a long time, but they're weak. They don't know a lot about the body of truth surrounding Christ. And they said, bring them in, receive them, but don't bring in and then cause division and contention over it because you're going to bring them, they're not going to believe some things like you believe. They're not going to see things the way you see it, and it's going to take some time. So don't receive people in simply so you can have a fight and show them where they're wrong and you're right. We receive them that are weak in the faith, but we don't do it for a doubtful disputation over matters that don't matter. Amen. Here's a funny thing. Uh, Someone will say, well, what, what in the Bible doesn't matter? Well, everything in the Bible matters, but there are some things that don't matter as much as other matters. Amen. Are you living a holy life pleasing to God today? That matters a whole lot more than, oh, let's just pick something. Is the earth flat? Yeah. And that kind of childishness brings division in the church. That's not what God wanted. Amen. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Now somebody's going, I don't know, is the earth flat? 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men, be strong. What is he referring to? The body of truth surrounding faith in Jesus Christ. Stand fast in it. Don't be compromised. Don't be pushed around. Fight like men if necessary. Not amongst ourselves. That's against them out there. Okay? All right. Now, look, I, I, I want to be very careful here because I, I, if you saw my notes, you'd see that I really am. I'm, I'm giving you just the bare essentials here. And I wrote down everything that I did because I want to be able sometime to go back and do more with this just for my own study. So I'm, I'm just trying to boil it down for you, okay? Distill it right down for you. The body of truth that, uh, that matters, I think, would be our fidelity and commitment to Jesus Christ. That matters. Obedience to the, the Bible and the Spirit of God. Those things matter a lot. Personal holiness. It matters are reaching the lost. Boy, that matters. There's no compromise on those things. But how does faith unify us? 
Let me just uh, give you a couple things to write down. And, and there's many of them, but I, I chose out three. How does faith, how does, sorry, how does the faith unify? It brings us together with one doctrine and one direction with a steadfast view of finishing our Christian race strongly. If, if the pastor of your church, be it here or anywhere else, if the pastor of your church, of a church, is fulfilling his threefold purpose, the outcome of those who are obedient to Ephesians 4 will be unity in, in the faith. And when we have unity in the faith, instead of striving with one another about particular doctrinal things, we are striving to finish our course. And that's what Paul said, 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He wasn't interested for the bulk of his life, even though he was human and he messed up too, for the bulk of his life, he was more interested in just keeping his eyes on the prize than he was in trying to bicker with everybody about particular things. How does, faith, how does the faith unify us? It brings us together and gives us a, a direction to finish strongly. Secondly, it helps us to treat everyone properly. I want you to look at um, James chapter number two. If I brought my son up here, he'd be able to quote it for you. James chapter number two. I won't do that to you, buddy. He's giving me this look. Don't. <laughs> James chapter number two. If, if we stand on the faith properly, we're going to treat people properly. And it says here in James chapter 2 and verse number 1, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. And then the rest of that chapter, he talks about how you end up mistreating people. Right? He talks about him that comes in with a, a good ring and good, a gold ring and goodly apparel, and you treat them one way, and then you treat the poor another way. Sit thou there. Stand thou there or sit here under my footstool. But if we stand on the faith, it'll help me to treat people properly because there's no respected persons with God. Amen. The third truth that I find is this. It gives us a common enemy. I want you to look at 1 Peter 5. I know you know the verses, but I'm, I'm trying to shed a new light on them for you if you haven't already seen this. 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verses 8 and 9. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. If the church is arguing with itself and fighting, who's fighting the devil? But if we come to unity of the faith, now we're going to fight the right enemy. Who resists steadfast, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in all the world? The devil, he's, he's one of our enemies, but can I also say, according to the book of Jude, uh, those who bring in heresies and divisions in the church, they're the enemy. And Jude said, look, I wanted to write to you about the common faith, but I can't because I've got to tell you to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And he tells us all about these people that are trying to creep into the church and bring in heresy and bad doctrine and divisions. And, and Jude's plain about it. Get rid of them. Well, I just think we ought to just embrace everybody and no. Get them out because they are destroying the unity of the faith and what they're doing. Please don't miss this. If I have this opportunity to preach this message in someone else's church, I'm going to preach it the same way. The pastor that's been given to you, when he has to contend with those that are embraced in the church who are causing divisions, do you see what begins to happen? 
Next thing you know, it's loggerheads with the divider in the church instead of being able to go about the business that he's been set to. If you don't get rid of the people in the church who are causing division and bringing in heresy, it's a pain in the neck to the pastor. (laughs) It is, okay? And they're the enemy. And too often what happens is that person will make the pastor the enemy. And he's not your enemy. All right, we okay? All right. The knowledge of the Son of God also unifies us there in chapter 4 of Ephesians. And and I'm going to finish here. So I just want you to hear me out, and I'll finish. Knowledge of the Son of God, this simply is the knowledge about Jesus Christ, both in the scriptural, factual, truthful sense, but in that intimate relationship that we have when we walk with Him. That pastor should be instructing you in the Bible in such a way to know about Christ so that you not only have it all up here, boy, I know everything there is to know about Jesus, but there is this deep relationship in your heart that causes you to walk with Jesus Christ and to know Him, not just to know about Him, to know Him. And when all of us, think about it, and you downstairs too and you at home, You think about it. If we all, we're endeavoring to let the Spirit of God keep the unity in the bond of peace. So we're endeavoring to walk in the Spirit of God. And we're endeavoring, you know, the pastor's endeavoring to study and preach and teach the Word of God. And you're endeavoring to receive that teaching like a Berean and to apply it. And and certainly there's things that I say that you got to discard. I'm not dumb. I know that. I don't do it on purpose, but you're endeavoring to be a Berean and you receive that and what's happening God is using all that and he's unifying that church and he's just closing it up tighter and tighter and tighter and it becomes rock solid so that in Ephesians 4 we're no more children tossed about to and fro with every wind of doctrine we are a mature man in the image of Christ and that church begins to become used by almighty God in a way we never even imagined because we have unity Unity in the faith. Boy, we believe the same thing. Unity about Jesus Christ. We, we know Him. There's not a handful that know Him. We know Him. Do you understand how important this is? The, the Christian life can't be a, a lazy life. So I finish by saying, we've got to accept responsibility for unity. Unity. There's a, res- there's a personal responsibility that each one of us has. To those two or three points of unity I've just discussed, there's a responsibility that all of us have. You can't shirk it, you can't put it on someone else, and you cannot blame someone else if you didn't do it. You have to take responsibility. You have a choice, which is tied to your responsibility. You have a choice to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. You have a choice to let the the ministry of the people gift that God's given you, you have a choice to allow that to bring about your knowledge of the faith and your knowledge of Jesus Christ. You have to make that choice. Well, you know, I, I show up every week and I don't know, I just don't really seem to get much out of it by your choice. Because... Yeah, there's some, there's some knuckle-headed pastors, I know it. I hope that I'm not counted amongst them. I really do. And I know that it's boring sometimes. Believe me, I know. You, if you go ask my family sometimes how many times I go home and I want to beat myself up over being so boring. But as long as the Bible is being preached, Amen. you ought to be able to gain something. I think we get this idea of the Apostle Paul. Oh, if we had the Apostle Paul here, oh, wouldn't that be something to hear? Yeah, it'd bore you to tears. Because when they caused division in the Corinthian church, you know what they caused it over? Apollos. The Paulus, the great orator. He could speak so well. Ha, huh, I'm of Apollos. Yeah, well, he may be a good speaker, but Paul, Paul, the doctrine of Paul. Boring. If you're getting the Bible, you ought to be able to get something out of it. 
And you have a personal humility. You're responsible for your own humility. Whether you will humble yourself and receive even what was teached today or not. That's up to you. I've got four more pages of notes that you'll never hear as far as I, I know. But I think that I've given you enough. I do. I really think I've given you enough. How do we achieve unity? Walk in the Spirit and let the person that God's put in front of you as a gift to teach you to know the faith and to know the Son of God. And that will bring unity. And when we can achieve that as, our, as a church, I, I'm just, I'm telling you, I, I'm telling you, if we achieve that as a church, God will do things through our church that we never imagined. Because he's not divided. Amen. Our Father, thank you for uh, the teaching of the scriptures, and I pray that you'd help us to apply it. And I pray, God, for me, that you'd help me to apply it. And I recognize, God, that I have probably a, an elevated responsibility, an additional responsibility. Because you didn't choose me for me, you, choose, you chose me for you. And God, I recognize and I acknowledge this morning my, my role before you, my job before you, my responsibilities before you, my accountability before you. And I want you, please, God, to help me do what I've been called to do that I might help your church achieve what you want it to be. And when I've finished that course, God, I pray you bring the right person along to take it even further. Help the people that are here today, those listening at home, to receive the word of God with a ready mind. To be doers of the word and not hearers only. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you. We're going to just go ahead and dismiss uh, with that. Appreciate you being here today. God bless you. And uh, we'll, we'll be dismissed. <laughs>